Well, there'll be more time for fellowship and for encouragement for one else after Law Chapel. There will be lunch provided. Um, but at this time, it's my supreme pleasure to um, welcome Professor Brauch, who's going to come. He's going to introduce several other speakers. There's so much I could say about Professor Brauch. Um, if you didn't know, which perhaps you didn't, when I applied, Professor Brauch was still the dean. And I still remember this day he called me, and I thought, this can't be the dean, like the dean. And I remember looking up, and well, at first I didn't know how to say his name, but I, I looked it up, and uh, I double-checked. And I said, wow, the dean called me. And I remember he prayed with me. And it was so impactful, and it was a huge reason why I came to Regent. And then after Regent, we connected, and he's been just a wonderful mentor to me. He's meant a lot. He was a dean for almost two decades. So a person that really needs no introduction, I could say so much more, but I'm going to go ahead and this time and ask, let's give Professor Brock a warm Regent welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much, Blaine. And I'm very thankful you came, by the way. Uh, but thanks to you and to the worship team for leading us into the presence of God today. Really encouraging. And today is going to be encouraging. I promise you that you'll be encouraged by the session that we're about to have, though it's not going to seem that way as I start. And I, I want to tell you, have you take a look if, uh, with the numbers on the screen here. Uh, I want you to look at four numbers. These are numbers, but they represent people. They represent lives. Uh, the first one, 65.3 million, that's the number of people today who are displaced from their homes as a result of war, persecution, terror around the world. We know of Syria, but it's taking place in many places. 250,000 is the number, approximate number, of children who have been, been forced to become child soldiers in various conflicts around the world. 1,207 is the verified known number of our brothers and sisters who were killed for being Christians last year. Uh, this number comes from open doors, and what they report is that the number is much higher because none of these numbers come from Iraq or Syria because they can't get uh, verified data from those places right now. And 45.8 million is the number of people who are held in some form of slavery today around the world. It's the greatest number ever enslaved, much greater than the number before William Wilberforce, much greater than uh, around the time of our Civil War. And so I share that with you, and I don't know how you feel when you hear that stuff, but I'm tempted to despair. I'm tempted to think, what can possibly be done with numbers like that? Until I remember that we have a God who is sovereign over this universe. He knows about this. He is a God of justice. He's a God who knows, cares, loves. He cares for the poor and the oppressed. His heart is for them. And in fact, his command to his people at all times is this. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. And that's his call to his church and his people at all times. But I feel a special, I don't know, affinity for this call because as lawyers and as prospective lawyers, we can do this very literally. And I think that was one of the motivations that prompted this school to start a Center for Global Justice in 2010. Both looking at those numbers and seeing what was going on around the world, hearing this call by God, but it was also seeing students come to this place who had a sense of that call. The people were coming who wanted to practice law, but they wanted to use their legal education to, to literally do this and speak for those who cannot speak for themselves. And so we began the Center for Global Justice. And I'll just tell you very briefly about it because what you most want to do today is hear from some of the students who are working with the center. But the center has a couple of missions. One is to train the next generation of advocates who are going to go out to do this, who are going to be human rights advocates in the next generation, to speak for those who cannot speak for themselves. But it's also to stand alongside groups who are already doing great work, like the International Justice Mission, Shared Hope International. There are Christian groups, and even non-Christian groups, that are doing great work to protect the poor and the oppressed around the world, and we want to come alongside them. So the center does that by coursework. You can take classes here on trafficking in persons, international human rights, international criminal law, and others. We have a student staff, some of whom you're going to hear from today, who are every semester working on projects with some of the organizations I mentioned, International Justice Mission, Shared Hope International, 
they're working on real legal projects that are making a difference around the world. Virginia's uh, sex trafficking law is different today. It is stronger today because our staff worked on a project like that. Uganda is treating uh, those who um, engage in child sacrifice much more severely under the law because of legal work that our center did. Right now, our center staff is working on a project to send a memo to the Human Rights Committee of the United Nations. They've asked for written comments on something that you'll be amazed that they are thinking of this, that they're, they're thinking that the right to life ought to include the right to have an abortion, that the right to abortion should be part of the right to life, and so we are drafting a response to the Human Rights Committee regarding that, and I'd ask that you'd pray about that. The staff's doing amazing work. But one of the other really exciting things that the staff does and that those who are here at the school can do is participate in internships. And so every summer, students go all over the world working on human rights issues with groups that are on the ground doing great work. And uh, this is the group that went last summer. You'll recognize a number of these folks. Uh, they were last summer, our, our students last summer were in Korea, Mongolia, Peru, South Africa, Uganda, and various sites around the United States, including Hawaii, uh, in funded internships. So if you're a 1L and you're thinking, well, I'm not sure what I'm going to do this summer, watch for emails that come out and for a meeting that we'll have in November, I think, to talk about these internships. They're funded by donors to the law school. And one of my favorite things around here is to talk with the interns when they get back because what they do is life-changing for those they go to serve, but it's life-changing for them too. And I want you to hear from them for most of our time. And so four of our interns from last summer are going to share with you what they did and what the experience was like for them. And so Lorianne Drazen is going to come. I think Anna Colby will be next, Mariah Schmidt, and then Brandon Goodwin. And I'd ask that you just come uh, forward after each other. So um, Lorianne, why don't you begin? Thank you so much. And I have my phone in case I need to pull up my virtual Bible. Um, so I uh, am a 2L. My name is Lorianne Drazian, uh, like Professor Brock said. Um, also, speaking of deans, I think they place the deans in the front row to intimidate us when we talk. <laughs> it's OK. <laughs> I was just noticing that. If any of the 1Ls want to come to the front row, that would be encouraging. <laughs> um, and so I had the privilege. I'm not that I had the privilege of going to Jerusalem, Israel this past summer and working with an organization called um, the Jerusalem Institute of Justice, um, an organization that um, many uh, interns from Regent have gone to in the past. So I was, I was very excited. Just one note, because this is going to drive me crazy. My name has no E. But <laughs> just so you know, in case you want to write me a personal letter, just, <laughs> just don't include the E, and then it's perfect. But, <laughs> OK. OK, sorry. As attorneys, attention to detail. I'm sorry. That bothered me. Um, so I just want to share some of the things that I did in Israel. And then I also want to encourage you, because um, I know when I was sitting in the 1L's um, chairs last year, I heard these interns talking. And I was literally thinking, wow, I, how could I ever do anything like like them. I, I'm not as smart as them, maybe. I'm, I'm not as brave as them to go to some of these places. But, but here I am, and I, I was able to do some of the things that they did. So I just want to encourage you um, that if you're intimidated and you think, oh, I don't know if I can, maybe I'm not smart enough, maybe I'm not brave enough, maybe God's not calling me there, um, just look at my life as an example. I did it. And so if I can do it, you can do it too. So please be encouraged by that. So um, one of the um, awesome things that I got to take a part in while working for the Jerusalem Institute of Justice, and I, I took part in many, many great things, so it was actually really difficult to choose um, just one thing to share with y'all. And I think that would be, um, was working on a project um, with the Institute um, against human trafficking and against prostitution in Israel. Um, in the 1990s, I don't know if y'all are familiar, but Israel had a horrible problem of sex trafficking. Um, and through the work of many nonprofits, NGOs, like the Jerusalem Institute of Justice, the number of sex trafficking has dropped by 99%. That doesn't sound real 
When have you heard of something dropping by 99%? I had to look, when they told me that, I thought, wonderful, great, I love fake statistics. And I went and Googled it, and it's real. 99%. That's a, y'all, y'all, that's a miracle. 99%. So I got to, I got to work with them in researching um, human trafficking and prostitution. One of the amazing pieces of history that took place while I was there this summer was that for eight years, the Jerusalem Institute of Justice, a very small office, I think there was, there was two employees and the rest of us, um, the eight of us were interns, very tiny. They cram us in there. In Israel, they like to cram you into tight spots on the bus, everywhere, just lots of cramming. But they've been working for eight years to implement the buyer's law in Israel. And I'm not sure if you're familiar, but the buyer's law is um, a law against prostitution that criminalizes the buyer of prostitution. And it's also called the Nordic model. So it's been very successful in some of the um, uh, Scandinavian countries. I think Sweden was the first country to implement that. And so for eight years, the Jerusalem Institute of Justice has been working towards fighting prostitution, fighting human trafficking. And this summer, in July, while I was in Jerusalem, the Knesset, the the legislature for Israel, passed its first round, um, the first level of votes that has to take place, of a bill to implement the buyer's law in Israel. Isn't that amazing? For eight years. And then I was so blessed to be there this summer that it actually got passed through the Knesset. And I wish I could tell you that I knew what the stage of it was now, but unfortunately I don't. Uh, And so I'm really hoping that it's going to get all the way through and that Israel is going to, again, get to like an amazing victory against uh, prostitution and human trafficking. Um, And if I still have a little bit more time, I'd just like to share some of my personal, I think I have more photos, so. That was me. I just climbed um, uh, Masada. There's ruins at the top of Masada, if, you, if any of y'all are familiar with Israel. And so um, I'm glad it's not as zoomed in because it was a long hike. And I sweated a lot. So <laughs> it's hot in Israel. But um, personally, I really went through an amazing spiritual journey, but very different from what I thought it was going to be like because I thought, wow, I'm going to Israel. I've always wanted to go to Israel. I'm going to have this amazing spiritual experience. I just thought the Holy Spirit would just the minute I got off the plane, it would just be, I would be healing people, and I would be getting all of the Jewish people to believe in the Messiah. So I really had high expectations for my trip to Israel. That didn't happen. I'm pretty sure I was lost for 30 minutes after getting off the plane. I should have called in the Holy Spirit then. Um, but I think, re- and I'm still learning what the Lord has taught me this summer, but one of the things that I learned was learning what it's like to be spiritually lonely. And I don't know, that's not a technical term. You're not going to find it in the Bible. I'm pretty sure I just made it up 20 minutes ago. But I truly feel like I really had to struggle with what it's like to be spiritually lonely. And I'm going to define what I think that means. I am so fortunate to grow up in a family that loves the Lord, that taught me my salvation is in um, Yeshua the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And I'm so fortunate to be in a country where I can freely believe that. And I'm spoiled to be at Regent where I have faculty that continually just enforces that belief in me. I have students that encourage me in that belief. And I've never been in an environment where I truly feel like that I'm the only one on this entire bus that believes that. I'm the only one in my neighborhood who believes that. I could be walking down the street in the taxi, and maybe I feel like I'm the only one who believes that. And for me, that was my first time feeling what I have called spiritual loneliness. But I think what the Lord had taught me through that is that I'm not spiritually alone. I just felt that way because I have been I'm so fortunate to be around people who encourage me in my faith. And so the Lord really showed me through amazing encounters that I wasn't spiritually lonely and that there were people in my path that he sent me to be encouraged. And I could go on and on and on, but just to name a few, um, Ariel Bryant, a 2L classmate of mine, also came to Jerusalem, and we were able to meet up and have dinner the time she was there. And that was so encouraging for me, to have someone I knew was familiar with, a Regent student. Um, Also, while I was staying at the guest house in Israel, uh, guests came that go to my synagogue here in Norfolk. They came into the guest house, saw me, and I mean, I think we screeched for like five minutes, and then I realized, 
what are they doing here? They go to my synagogue back in Norfolk, and I really saw how God was putting the pieces together and showing me that I wasn't spiritually alone. So I just want to encourage you that if you feel spiritually alone, that you're, you're truly not, and to pray for those people in those areas who are going out there, and they don't have the community that we have. So I'm sorry, I know I went over time. I can talk and talk and talk and talk. That um, also was me and some of the other interns with, and that says ahava, which is love in Hebrew. And so I just want to end on that. Love is the most important thing, and if um, you feel like you need love, just know you're in the, the right spot and that our faculty is amazing, the students are amazing. We just want to love on you, and nobody has to be spiritually alone. Not on my watch. <laughs> okay, I'm going to pass this on. Hi guys, I'm Anna. I think a lot of you know me because I like meeting people. Um, if I sound shaky, I'm not nervous. I'm just crazy cold right now. Um, okay, so I went to Mongolia where I was so lucky to ride a camel, but that was not my internship. That was a class. Um, <laughs> that was a class that Regent Law offers. Um, I went, and Brandon, who we'll talk later, went on the first class that Regent has had in Mongolia, and they will offer it next summer. Uh, this is a little advertisement. Go. It is the coolest nation ever. No expectations, because no one knows about it beyond like Genghis Khan. You need to go there. It is fabulous, but that's that. Isn't it pretty? Just look at that. It's so pretty. OK, this is me in Korea. Um, so my internship was in South Korea. It was split. Um, part of the week, I did two days at a crisis pregnancy center, which I was not expecting and, and is what I'm going to talk about. And then I did the rest of the week working on refugees and North Korean defectors, which I cannot talk about because we're being filmed. But it was super cool, and I'm really interested in that little country above South Korea. And if you are too, you should come talk to me later when we're not on camera, and I can talk to you about it. Okay. <laughs> so... Um, when, yeah, so I really have a heart for refugees, for immigration, um, human rights. My grandma was a refugee coming to the United States. Um, I think talking about refugees is very timely here. I was really excited um, to go learn and, and research and do that kind of stuff in South Korea. I was not expecting at all to work for a crisis pregnancy center. Um, when I got there, they were like, hey, can you do a couple days there? And I was like, I'm in Korea, I guess so. Um, but I'm really thankful I did. Um, I know Region is a very pro-life place, which is awesome. Um, and I'm pro-life too, but before this summer, I was like, yeah, I'm pro-life, but like that's someone else's calling. Um, like I believe in saving the unborn, but it just wasn't something that I was really passionate about talking about, um, communicating about. Um, and this summer really opened my eyes in a way that I was not expecting at all. Um, South Korea has one of the highest abortion rates in the world and um, abortion is illegal there. So it was a little bit of a surprise. Um, it's basically, yeah, it's very easy to get an abortion there even though it's illegal. And it's not really talked about. It's something that everyone knows they can have happen and lots of people do have happen, but um, people don't really talk about it. If they, It's, it's uh, not common to have a child out of wedlock. So um, people are either very shamed if they decide to have a child outside of wedlock, um, or majority of them just go get an abortion. So the work that the crisis pregnancy um, is doing in Pohang, South Korea, where I was, is very important. Um, I was struck by how brave the women are who come and give birth there. They, they move from their cities. Um, oh, I'm going to share a little bit about a friend of mine who um, is from the Philippines, and she, the crisis pregnancy center I was working with is the only one in South Korea that um, works with non-Koreans. They work with Koreans as well, but also with non-Koreans because they're the only uh, like English-speaking English -speaking capability crisis pregnancy center. Um, there's a lot of children who are born in crisis pregnancy centers and then just stay in orphanages. I was kind of shocked because in America we're kind of um, post orphanage, like we have uh, like group homes and foster care, stuff like that. Um, in Korea, it's a lot of orphanages and a lot of kids aren't getting adopted, um, which was really sad for me um, because of, of some laws that have taken place there. So I was learning a lot, a bit, a lot about that. Um, I got to spend a significant amount of time with um, a, a young woman who was just a couple years younger than me who 
um, found out she was pregnant at seven months, um, moved straight to this to the city where I was from her university town um, to give birth. And my parents had tried several times when I was growing up to adopt, and so I'd definitely been on the side of the adoptive family and the emotions that that entails. But I had never, um, I guess, thought as much about the side of the birth mom and what they walk through and those emotions as they're choosing whether to keep their child and, and be in this unknown of what that's like of what suddenly raising a child is like or that selfless decision for them to give their child to someone because they think that would be a be better opportunity for their unborn child so um that was really really interesting to walk through very eye-opening um legally i was legally speaking i was working on a legislative project for the crisis pregnancy center um because abortion is still legal but so many it's so widespread um they're anticipating that abortion might become legal in the next few years and so they wanted to know um what kind of options they had once abortion becomes legal to restrict it in different places and as you know across the, the 50 states the united states we have a lot of different ways of restricting abortion um different states approach that differently and so they wanted to know um what that was like kind of what they could be um expecting to to be able to present to the parliament i don't it's not a congress in south korea i should know that um so that was that was really good kind of what struck me if you're wondering like if you're wondering at all if you should do an international legal internship you should like apply for the center they give you a grant to go internationally like why would you not right <laughs> and you can split your summer so i split my summer doing um one internship in the united states and then this internship there but um what was kind of surprising is that as a 1l coming out of being a 1l i was expecting um someone to walk through like the whole time with me and kind of mentor my writing projects and tell me i did what I, what I could change, and that's not really what internships are like, I found out. They're kind of like, hey, you went through a year of law school, you know what you're doing, here's this. Um, which is kind of, you, you learn a lot, so, so you will learn a lot. What was also really cool is that um, I got to have roommates from all over the world. So I was staying at a law school college campus, which is our sister school, Handong Law School in um, Korea. And I don't know if there's a laser, but that's me. Then the person next to me um, was my roommate. She's from Uzbekistan. Super cool. Really good conversations. The one next to her is from Pakistan. Also really cool conversations. They're both law students. And then on the right side was another girl from Uzbekistan who was her cousin. Who's the, she's like one of the only Christians in her family. My roommate isn't a Christian yet. Um, and so we had a lot of good conversations. It was really cool for me to to be able to live with a Muslim woman and have these conversations about God and what she thinks about the world and why she's at a Christian law school. <laughs> um, really cool. I think I have one more picture. Oh yeah, that's Korea. Look how pretty it is. Um, there is rice paddy fields in the in the background. That is like the Great Wall of the area of Korea where I was. It's from like 1200, something like that, which was really cool. That might be it. Oh no, that's also Korea. Like one of the techiest nations ever. I felt so dumb about everything. Um, you like you walk to a door and you input buttons to get in. No keys for anything. So if you want to learn about technology and people and legislative issues, you can go to Korea. I think that's it. Oh no, this is us in front of Parliament in Mongolia. Again, I'm gonna end on that. Go to Mongolia, coolest nation ever. Brandon will tell you more about working in Parliament in Mongolia, which is what he did but I don't think he's talking next. But talk to me if you want more info. Five minutes is a short amount of time to talk about an entire summer. Um, Mariah. I'm a little bit taller. Well, okay, so keeping this concise will be very difficult, but my name is Mariah Schmidt. I'm a 3L, and I'm also, I also work for the center, and then this summer I interned, this is actually the second time I've been able to intern over the summer with a Center for Global Justice grant. Last summer I went to Uganda, which is an awesome experience. We had somebody go again this year, and if you're interested in that, you can talk to any of us about that. And this summer I went to Kona, Hawaii, to the University of the Nations. And I know what you're thinking, okay, so that's a vacation, that's not an internship. <laughs> Even though Hawaii is beautiful and I loved seeing it and the beaches and everything, what I will come away from 
with this internship that I'll remember for the rest of my life is definitely two things. First, the amazing legal experience I obtained while there. And then second, the amazing spiritual experience and how I learned to follow God more with my legal career and with my life. So these pictures aren't going to really um, coincide to what I'm saying. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> well, anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Okay, there we go. So these are the Anjos, and then they had an Annie while I was there helping with their kids. So one of the coolest things about working with the Anjos, the University of the Nations, and YWAM in particular is how family-oriented everything is. So lots of times I would just hang out at their house with their kids trying to uh, – type on my computer and help me with the, with their notes, which I love kids, so it's awesome. But just the two things I really want to you to come away with that I think would be relevant to everyone is, um, first, God truly will grant you the desires of your heart, that verse in the Bible, can apply to everything, your legal career, your school, and then also when you, when God calls you to do something, he'll definitely equip you. He doesn't, um, call the equipped. He equips the called. I've heard that expression so many times in my life, and I found that it's it's really, really true. Um, we, I would work on, I'd work on contract things, property things, things from one all year that when I was in them, I thought, there is no way this is ever going to be interesting or that I will understand this, but that was not true. Praise the Lord. Um, because, and there's some turtles, yeah. So, one thing I realized is so at the University of the Nations, it's a ministry of youth with a mission, YWAM, which is an international missions organization. They train up young people to know God and to make God known. This is something I did. They have a three or well, six month program in any of their bases across the world that you learn a whole lot about Jesus and then you learn how to go to a different country and live out what you've learned. And it was an amazing time in my life. I did that when I was 18, and when I left, I was like, I'm not done with my way. I want to go back so bad. And then I came to law school, and I had no idea that I would ever at all, it did not cross my mind that I would be able to incorporate something that I loved so much, missions and youth with a mission, and exactly, and then my, my law school, my legal career. And it's just amazing to see God put those two together. And when I came to law school, even though I wasn't really willing to come at that point, how he blessed that and then l allowed me to do something that I so loved. And I was able to then e experience how these concepts, contracts, and property can help missionaries across the world by making this organization run smoothly and effectively. And then at the beginning of everything, the um, the they, they pray, the angels pray, everybody worships together several times a week, the whole base, there'll be hundreds of people, and it was just amazing, and such a good experience to have after 2L year, which 1L year and 2L year both can be um, a little bit stressful, I don't want to depress anybody uh, who's a 1L and looking to, towards the future, it's totally possible with God, all things are possible. It's just good sometimes to take a break and reset and realize you know, God's got this. He called me here. He's not going to leave me here without his presence and his help. And then when you when you pray before a contract, when you pray at a meeting trying to figure out this difficult legal issue with the people you work with, or if you're not in a Christian firm, just praying, it's just amazing to see God come in and intervene and say, hey, I do care about this too. I called you to do this, and so I'm going to help you to do this. And so um, just with any... Thing that you do in your life, I just want to encourage you that when you when you put God first, He will bless it, and then He will help you to live out your desires and the passions that you have um, for helping the poor or helping whoever it may be. Just being a Christian in the legal realm, there's just an amazing capacity to bless others, and so when you put God first in that, you'll be able to see that and help other people and and just the, the, what the desire of my heart was was to be a aiding and assisting missionaries and. I was able to do that with things that at the time I just didn't think were that helpful. And so that's what I just want to leave you with. Um, we have one more person to talk about his experience, and I just want to encourage you all that it's, it's possible, it's worth it, it will be all worth it in the end, because when you get to see God 
weaving together your passions and ministries and then the skills he's equipped you to do and putting him first with his spirit, then all things are possible. The end. <laughs> So I don't have any fancy pictures for you. Um, my name is Brandon Goodwin. I'm a 2L. Um, I'm also the token male on the student staff of the Center for Global Justice. I'm the only one except the professors, of course. Um, so if you're a 1L and you're a guy, please come. Please. <laughs> That's all I ask. Um, so I, was in, I went to Mongolia with Anna, uh, and she was there for that first week with Professor Walton. We were doing a class. Um, it was a really great experience. I actually stayed. Um, and did a six-week internship with the Parliament of Mongolia, um, which I walked into their office on the first day, and I'm like, what am I doing? And they're like, whatever you want. Um, and I said, all right. Um, so I actually uh, chose to, uh, they wanted, you know, something that would help Mongolia. And I said, you know, what is the country struggling with? And I'm a corporate guy, so I was like, you know, I am the rule of law. You always forget that. Center for Global Justice, Human Rights, and the rule of law. The rule of law, that's me. Um, <laughs> So I was like, how can I use business? You know, I'm really interested in business to help people. And then I looked at the securities regulation. Don't get too excited, all right? Um, securities regulation of Mongolia and found there was a lot of inconsistencies with normal investors and that they couldn't invest money and that businesses were actually taking advantage of average people just because they didn't understand the corporate framework of the country. So I actually wrote a paper um, that they're publishing in November, so I'm really happy about that. Um, in their corporate law, in their law review of Mongolia, so I'm really happy about that. Um, so um, I think it was a wonderful experience, but I think there was a lot of struggles at times because only one person in the office spoke English, um, and everybody else spoke a hybrid of languages. Um, so another guy spoke Russian, another guy spoke German. Um, and my, those languages, for me, I'm better at Russian, decent at German, so it was like you know, a three-way translating, you know, trying to translate the law. Like, and um, so it was like difficult at times. Um, and then just living in a foreign country was kind of difficult, especially Mongolia. Um, it was kind of like, you know, it's kind of based off the Soviet system, so it was kind of like trying to figure stuff out. And everybody's moved to a new place, you know, and you try to figure out, you know, where's the bank? Where's the grocery store? You know, where's everything at? And you're like, you're getting frustrated. You're like, I can't find anything. Um, <laughs> and I think that I did get frustrated at one time, and, you know, I you know emailed Professor Walton. I was like, I can't find anything. There's no one here. I'm by myself. I just, I go to work, I leave, I go home, and I sit there and, like, just, like, you know. <laughs> You know, I got really good at twiddling my thumbs, like really good. And um, I emailed him. I was like, "There's nothing to do here. I have no, f you know, I don't have very many friends here. I don't know anyone in Mongolia." And uh, he's like, "You know, I don't." You know, Professor Wong goes, "You know, how's your spiritual life?" And I said, "Not, not very good." Uh, and you know that he turned me to a scripture, uh, Jeremiah 29:13. that says, "You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart." I wasn't doing it. And uh, so I was like, "All right, let, let me give this a try." And sure, I started, you know, you know, reading scripture. I started, you know, seeking God a little bit more. And I, I walk out my door and, you know, I meet five people. We go play basketball. We become best friends. <laughs> you know, I was like, I was like, what? You know, is this how this works? You know, I found the grocery store. I found the bank. I found everything. I was like, God just really helps me. Um, you know, and that turned me to another, you know, Isaiah 58, 11. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land. will strengthen your frame, and you will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. It's true. You start seeking God. Like, my Westlaw started just finding searches for me. Like, I swear, I was trying to write this article, and I couldn't find sources, and I would just click on things, and it would be like, oh, you know, there's a proposition I need to support. Boom. You know, it was just like, it was amazing how, that, how fast that works. Um, so I just want to encourage you to say, you know, God will guide you. God will prepare you, you know, but if you're not seeking him, he's not going to help you. Like, you know, you got to seek him out. You got to seek with all your heart. You got to put your mind to it. You got to, you know, commit your soul, commit your heart to God and he will, he'll help you. Um, so I encourage you definitely go to Mongolia next year. It's a blast. You get to see Professor Walton ride a horse, which is a really fun experience. <laughs> See Professor Walt gallop on a horse is quite an awesome experience, I gotta say. Um, so please go, please do it. It's a really good time, and I had a really good experience working for the parliament of another country. Um, I mean, how many times do you get to do that? Um, and I had guys at meetings, you know, I was in a meeting with a couple parliament, actually the Speaker of the House of Mongolia, and I'm sitting in the back corner, and he's like, you know, what do you think, Brandon? <laughs> and I'm like, what do you mean? And he calls me, he's like, come sit at the table. And I'm sitting at a table with a bunch of parliament members and like on security regulation. I've never taken a class on security regulation. <laughs> I haven't even taken business associations <laughs> at that point. And they're like, what do you think? I'm like, oh man. <laughs> so it was really interesting. You get a lot of good opportunities. So uh, I'll leave you at that. So thank you.
Let's give one more round of applause for all of our speakers and thank Professor Brout for the wonderful work that they are doing. So with that, we, we have just a couple brief announcements. You've seen it for the last several weeks. I believe there may be a slide. It has a cool picture of a phone. It's the Law Review Symposium. So that is coming up. It is this Saturday. So that will be a great experience. I don't know if any of your professors are offering extra credit, but nonetheless, come regardless. And I, I believe there will also be CLE credits. So that's this Saturday. Um, again, talking about uh, what Brandon just shared about seeking the Lord with all your heart, a great opportunity to do that is Tuesday morning at 7 o'clock. It's early, but we offer Bible study. We offer that for every single student. And we'd like to get some of the professors, maybe faculty, to come too. But we break up. We have generally coffee and donuts, sometimes food. We break up into guys and gals and spend some time fellowshipping and um, sort of discussing God's word. We've been going through the book of Philippians. And then lastly, today is the final day. If you are interested in going to the Christian Legal Society Conference, that is going to be the week after fall break. So it's going to be that Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. It's in California. So the school will pay some of the fees. They essentially pay for um, lodging. You, pr you pay for some of the meals and for transportation, essentially, to get there. But if you're interested, you need to act on it today. So come see me or seek out Hannah Hempstead. I don't know. If, I don't think Hannah's here. So come, come and see me today. That's the last day to do that. And lunch is sponsored today and will be provided. So I see Samantha Graham in the back. I'll invite her to make her way up. And uh, so it's sponsored by the Center for Global Justice and Public Policy. So J or JGPP, I think that's the acronym. Um, so let's welcome Samantha, who's going to be sponsoring one. He came really close on really those close. initials, really close. Uh, it's actually the Journal for Global Justice and Public Policy, so it's JGJPP. Uh, just call it journal for short. Nobody's going to remember those initials. Um, I'm the editor-in-chief of the journal. Um, at the end of your 1L year, you'll have all these fun opportunities to join skills boards and to join academic journals. At Here at Regent, uh, we have Law Review, of course, and we have the Journal for Global Justice and Public Policy. You do not have to work for the center to be on the journal and vice versa. You can be on the journal without being part of the center. However, I encourage you to be part of both. As you've seen from the testimony here, our center is incredible and offers you so many wonderful opportunities. Um, and the journal does just as much. Uh, the journal focuses, like the center does, on international, foreign, and uh, comparative law. Uh, that doesn't mean, by the way, that we only talk about the United Nations or the Hague Convention or human trafficking, although we do talk about those things. We also talk about domestic violence, upcoming wars, and uh, things of that nature. So we talk about all kinds of topics. Um, contrary to what America seems to believe, other countries affect us. Uh, it's not all about the US all the time. Uh, so we look at other countries, see what's going on with them, what kind of laws are they pushing, what kind of policy are they pushing. Is it good policy, is it bad policy, why, and will it work for us here? Um, so we take notes and, and articles written by law students here and internationally, lawyers here and internationally, and uh, we publish them for other law schools, both in the U.S. and internationally, to read and to think on these things. So it's an amazing thing to be a part of the journal and to uh, sharpen your legal research and writing skills, sharpen your blue booking skills, uh, and your ability to meet deadlines. Deadlines are a big part of being part of journal. And we sharpen these skills, and in the process, you get to be a part of contributing to the academic world and contributing to these good thoughts, these discussions. And it's really just an amazing experience. So I would encourage uh, those 1Ls to consider applying for the journal uh, in the spring. And in the fall, we're in the winter, I should say, we're opening it back up to 2Ls and 3Ls. So I will be hunting you down. <laughs> Looking for new members. Um, I do encourage you to be a part of the journal. We're a good family experience. and. We're lots of fun, and you learn great skills, and you get to read about amazing topics and hear amazing thoughts. So I would encourage you to be part of the journal uh, when that time comes for you. I know you've got other things on your minds, one else, but I would encourage you in the spring to keep an open mind. Uh, with that said, I will pray for us, and we'll have uh, lunch in a minute. We've got Costco sandwiches, which I know all of you are loving every week. Um, and we also have a couple things that are a little different. There's homemade queso and homemade pies outside. Um, I would just encourage you to uh, take all things in moderation. Remember, there are people coming behind you, so make sure everybody gets their fair share. And then if there are seconds, help yourself. Um, but I'll pray for us, and we can leave. 
Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that we have this time every week that we can all come together and praise you and uh, hear words that you place on people's hearts, hear about their experiences, Lord, and come to love you even more, uh, both in our devotional lives and in our legal lives, Lord, that you have a place in both and that you help us, and without you we are nothing, and that with all things you can give us strength to get through law school, to pass the bar, uh, and to be great lawyers who serve you in all that we do. Um, please bless this food, help it nourish our bodies, and help us to uh, continue the day in, in a positive attitude and a positive light about the things we can accomplish for you in this world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.